challenge is uh, you can memorize any verse of the scripture for the first time for the scripture memory challenge. And Brother Charlie will memorize the same verse of the scripture and run a mile for it. And so it's a great deal, especially if you can figure out when he's going to go running and go and watch. And uh, so very entertaining. So very good for us in every way. Please open your Bibles to Revelation chapter 15 this evening. Revelation 15. And uh, we will again transition into a place in Revelation where God the Son is now going to uh, be setting in order the stage of events that will destroy the wicked and set up Christ's kingdom. Revelation 15. I want to read verses 1 through 3, and then we'll pray and ask God's help tonight, and then we'll get right into our text. Verse 1 of Revelation 15. And I saw another sign in heaven, great and marvelous, seven angels having the seven last plagues, for in them is filled up the wrath of God. And I saw as it were a sea of glass, a sea of glass mingled with fire. And them that had gotten the victory over the beast, and over his image, and over his mark, and over the number of his name, stand on the sea of glass, having the harps of God. And they sing the song of Moses, the servant of God, and the song of the Lamb, saying, Great and marvelous are thy works, Lord God Almighty. Just and true are thy ways, thou King of saints. Let's read verse 4. I didn't mean to separate from the context. Who shall not fear thee, O Lord, and glorify thy name? For thou only art holy. For all nations shall come and worship before thee, for thy judgments are made manifest. Father, tonight we recognize that judgment and righteousness is what you want, what you've always wanted, what you've always desired of the nation. And God, in order to have righteousness from us, you and your holy character and nature slew your own son so we could have your righteousness. And so we begin our message tonight with the recognition that there is nothing lacking with regard to our ability to be righteous and to be what you expect us to be. And so we, as we see this question of who would stand against you, we recognize that no one could stand righteously or stand in their right because of the cross of Jesus. And we pray that you would help us with our understanding of our text this evening. We ask in Jesus' name. Amen. Well, this is... The, we're coming to the climax of events in Revelation, but I'd like to do just a little review this evening to make sure that we have our context, of course. Uh, somebody help me um, with first the reason why it is important that we study Revelation. Why is it important to study Revelation? Yeah, I mean, to be, to be honest with you, uh, there's a reward associated with it. You know, a lot of times we sort of berate a Christian who has an expectation that when they serve God, there will be a reward. I want to put that in perspective uh, just briefly this evening, just as a reminder. Why is it, what is it that we live for in this life? You read Ecclesiastes. And when it comes to things that are, Charlie mentioned this in Sunday school this morning, things that are under the sun, how much good is there in things under the sun? That is, things that are earthly. How much eternal is there in things under the sun? You can list anything that this world has to offer, and at best it is only temporary, and at best it is vanity. When we measure our lives and we look at how much we devote our resources, our time, and our attention to things that are in this life, it really is... Uh, embarrassing when you consider how much what we do counts for anything, isn't it? And so when somebody tries to say, well, you shouldn't do, you shouldn't live for Jesus just because of a reward, where does that line of thinking take you? What's wrong with being concerned with things that are beyond the sun? Is there anything that ought to be a priority beyond that? And the answer is no. 
We ought to be seeking God's blessing in our life all the time. But more than that, what is God's blessing? Well, God's blessing is a, a ringing and resounding endorsement. This, this is my plan. This is my way. This is my will. And I'll bless it. And so when we're told that the person who studies the Revelation, who reads the words in, in, the, in the Revelation, and studies Revelation has God's blessing, we ought to say that's a good enough reason to study and understand this book of prophecy. Isn't it so? Sure. All right, help me with the outline of Revelation, would you please? We study Revelation because there's promised a blessing in it. And by the way, is there, res is there a residual reward? Isn't it good to know the outcome of events? Wouldn't you like to know this evening if you're a football fan? Wouldn't you like to know right now? Taj wouldn't, right? Taj, you don't want to know, do you? Who's going to win right now? I mean, it could like ruin the service for you or make it so you can't concentrate. So one way or the other, it could be a bad thing. But the rest of us, I'd like to know, especially... Now, I was going to make a joke about being a gambler. I'm not a gambler. I'd say if I were a gambler, I'd like to know because I could, uh, you know, uh, I could profit by the outcome of it. Uh, if I knew the outcome of the game, I wouldn't check the news tonight or go and try to watch the end of it or whatever. Uh, but the reality of it is is that when we read Revelation, we find the outcome of the world. We find the outcome of the wicked. And we find out what God is going to do, what the final events, uh, the final things that God is going to do in this world are. And it's good to know the outcome. Okay, so what's the outline in Revelation? What? Revelation one nineteen. Revelation one nineteen, and what is it? What's the outline? Uh, things which thou hast seen, things which are, and things which are hereafter. Okay, so John is told, write the things which you have seen. And that would be the events explaining the introduction to Revelation. Here he is on the Spirit on the Lord's Day, and all of a sudden there's one that appears to him like the Son of Man. And so he's writing the things that he's seen, the things which are. Well, if you read the out, read Revelation, you find all the way up to chapter four are the letters uh, to the seven churches, and that would be the present. So the, the outline of Revelation is past, present, and future. The things which shall be hereafter is the things that are after what time? After the church. You never find another mention of the church in Revelation after the seven churches. You never see the church mentioned again throughout the rest of the book. And that's because God is through working with the church. If you study Romans and you study it carefully, one of the things uh, that you would see, first of all, would be that it is to the Jews that belong the covenants and the promises and so on and so forth. And there are things that God is still going to do in the future with Israel. And so now we are in that portion of Revelation where we're really seeing Israel. We saw uh, the we saw the mother travail in birth and with the, and had the son that was... And they were caught up, caught up, and they were uh, caught up to heaven. Then we see the twelve tribes, and the tribes are named after the twelve sons, uh, including Joseph, of course, and his two sons, uh, including his two sons, the twelve tribes of Israel. They're the hundred and forty-four thousand that are mentioned in Revelation, and God has now taught them a song. But go back with you, with me, if you will, to chapter fourteen. And uh, last week we saw, uh, we saw. In verse 3, I well, it may have been two weeks ago, I think it was last week. In verse 3, the Bible says, A song as it were a song, a new song before the throne. And this, is, of course, is the 144,000. And before the four beasts and the elders, and no man could learn that song but the 144,000 which were redeemed from the earth. Well, who are the 144,000? Well, if you go back in Revelation, you see that they are the ones who have the seal of God in their foreheads and the ones who refuse to have the mark of the beast. And now it's really coming down to those individuals that have taken the mark of the beast and uh, who are just trying to destroy the 144,000. And so that's where we're at in Revelation this evening. We we're not going to get into the plagues or the fight that, that are the wrath or the final representations of the seven angels of the wrath of God. And uh, But I want to look at what they are this evening. First of all, in verse 15, the Bible says in verse 1, I saw another sign in heaven, great and marvelous, seven angels having the seven last plagues. And then the next statement actually is rather astonishing, isn't it? For in them is filled up the wrath of God. Until this moment in time, the accusation that rebellious man has leveled against God is, if God is good, 
then why does God allow? Isn't it so? Isn't it amazing how what a forked tongue people speak with when it comes to God's goodness? In other words, I've had people say, well, if God's good, why does God judge? Have you ever heard that? If God's good, then why does He judge the wicked? Why does He judge sin? And the same people that say God shouldn't judge, and it means that He isn't good because He does, are the same people that say if God's good, then why does He allow all the evil in the world? You know what I'm talking about? And the answer is because God is long-suffering and God is merciful. God is good. God is good. Friend, herein is a reminder for all of us, for the wicked, first, you and I ought to desire mercy. And we ought to receive God's mercy. God is so long-suffering. God is so merciful. And we ought to desire... You know, when I hear people say, if God's good, then why doesn't He judge? I just think, man, if God judged, it'd get me. Right? If God judged the wicked people in this room, who would survive? Huh? Not a single one of us. All have sinned and come short of the glory of God. And you say, well, Pastor, you know, you must be really bad if you think uh, that you deserve judgment. But you know, I'm... <laughs> you know, I'm not... I'm nothing like you. I'm not so bad. My friend, if God judged the wicked, you wouldn't survive it. But God judged His Son in our place. If God is good, why does He allow the wicked? Well, that's a pretty good question, isn't it? How much should God have allowed for me? Based on the fact that He is a holy God, and holiness means no sin, right? Right? How much wickedness should God have allowed from me? Zero. None. It's very interesting, isn't it, when you study Romans and you recognize that, um, that before the law, sin was in the world. But sin is not imputed when there is no law. And the, the, it's the explanation that Paul is making that the law isn't what makes us sinners. The law just exists one of the benefits of it is that it makes sin exceeding sinful. In other words, our awareness of sin is better. But people died before God gave Moses a law. And why did they die? Nevertheless, from Adam until Moses, death reigned, Romans says. Why do people die? Sin. Okay, so how much sin would I have to commit before God destroys me? I'll tell you, I'd have to make it from the womb. Being born a sinner is enough to condemn me to hell based on the righteous, holy character of God. Now, if you will come with me to this scene in Revelation after we've already seen the seven seals, the seven trumpets, after we've already seen God begin to work and allow judgment on the world and the earth and allow this period of testing or trying or tribulation, after we've seen this period, do you recognize the importance of the word that the seven angels held or contained the seven plagues of all of the wrath of God. In other words, God's righteous, rightful anger, furious wrath is contained. Anybody ever seen something really powerful? How many of you have seen the Niagara Falls? Anybody ever seen the Niagara Falls? Could you imagine trying to stop the Niagara Falls? Just blocking it off. I mean, that's this pretty, pretty powerful, isn't it? Pretty forceful. Anybody ever been in a good hurricane, like a Cat 4, Cat 5, somewhere in there? Yeah? Can you imagine trying to stop a Cat 4? I mean, I remember uh, being in, uh, or going into, I was in Katrina, and uh, going down into Gulfport, Mississippi, which is where the brunt of the hurricane actually went. And I remember some of the scenes that I saw there. And one of the, a couple of the images, and I've, I've shared with our folks here quite a bit, because they, they're, Snapshots, because you just saw this vast devastation that was indescribable. It was just so big. And one of, the, one of the things that I remember is a Chevy Camaro in the ground up to its windshield, just like they, you know, a car was taken and thrown into the ground by the, by the forces of the hurricane. I imagine it was probably a tornado in the hurricane. And then another thing that I saw was a house, which it had been more than one level. I assume it was like a two-story house, where the lower level was gone, and the second level was setting perfectly on the slab or the foundation where the lower level had gone. In other words, the force, I think, of wind or flood or something came through and just took out the lower level. And the top level, did. it, it happened so fast. It was like when, you know, someone yanks a tablecloth off of a table with the glasses on it. And the second level of the house just sat down. There's no window, no doors, only windows. So you have this house with windows. And then I saw 
uh, a slab of concrete where a concrete block construction house was missing. And on the slab was a toilet in its place and a uh, plastic, one of those light up Santa Clauses that they put out at Christmas time. And that's all that was left uh, in the devastation. Can you imagine trying to stop something with that kind of force or that kind of power? See, these are snapshots of things that we see as powerful. You gotta read on the atomic bombs and, and on nuclear, uh, on the power of a hydrogen bomb. And you read of, of just the testing and uh, find out some of the vastness. I mean, I've done some pretty big explosions myself, but I'm talking about, you know, 40 miles of just, of a man-made bomb destroying something. And if you think about what man is capable of destructively, and you realize that the God who is literally, who spoke into existence the world, and is literally going to, heaven and earth are going to pass away, he's going to just, they're going to pass away with a great noise, gone. I mean, literally, when God judges the earth, there isn't going to be a particle left. Can you imagine that? And he's going to build a new heaven and a new earth after that. Now, just having an idea of God's might, God's ability, God's power, and God's righteousness, do you have a little bit of a glimmer of an understanding of what it must be that seven angels held the wrath of God? Are you stronger when you're angry or weaker? I'm not going to say God's stronger. I'm not going to make up some kind of new doctrine about it. But I'm just saying God's not weak in His wrath. You understand that? In other words... Uh, he's not going to be less. God is very gentle, isn't he? Have anybody ever experienced the love and just the gentleness of God? Man, I have so many times. It's just it's overawing. I mean, it's one of the powerful aspects of God is His love and the gentleness of His mercy. And that's done. Revelation 15, we see that the seven angels have the seven last plagues. This is it. These are the final plagues on men. And in them is filled up the wrath of God. Seven plagues that are filled up. Literally, the wrath of God is full in these plagues. And then we see in verse 2 a picture of judgment. I saw, as it were, a sea of glass mingled with fire, and them that had gotten the victory over the beast and over his image and over his mark and over the number of his name stand on the sea of glass having the harps of God. Go back with me, will you please, to chapter 14. Again, I want to look at verse uh, verse 1 through 3. I looked, and lo, a lamb stood on Mount Sion, and with him an hundred and forty-four thousand, having his father's name written on their foreheads. And I heard a voice from heaven as the voice of many waters, and as the voice of great thunder. And I heard the voice of harpers harping with their harps. I like that. That would make a great rhyme, wouldn't it? Harpers harping with their harps. Verse 3, And they sung as it were a new song before the throne and before the four beasts and the elders. And no man could learn that song but the hundred and forty and four thousand which were redeemed from the earth. Don't you feel a little excluded here? <laughs> aren't, you, aren't you just a little envious? There is, there is you know, a, I'll give them a name. And it's a secret name that God's going to give someone. And then here is a, I'm gonna, they're going to sing a song. And uh, nobody can know what the song is except for the hundred and forty four thousand. Let me just tell you something. I'm okay with that. <laughs> I'm okay with not being here when God's wrath is going to be meted out, when God's judgment is going to be poured out in its fullest. But I'm still curious. And so here you have the 144,000, and they're going to be playing harps. So this is pretty neat. We kind of have an, in, an, an idea of an instrument that will likely be used in heaven. It'll be a harp. And uh, the Bible says that these harpers are harping, and go back to chapter 15 and verse 2 now. We see, Them that had gotten the victory over the beast, and over his image, and over his mark, and over the number of his name, stand on the sea of glass. Now again, this sea of glass is, is uh, a sea of glass, the Bible says, mingled with fire. And so I have pictures in my mind for all of these images conjured up. I see the uh, four beasts that are around the throne of God, and those four beasts that, that are giving... Uh, the vials or the um, the um, angels that have the seven last plagues, giving them um, their their container that has the wrath of God, the full wrath of God in it, and then 
I see as well this group of individuals that have really been brought to the Lord Himself for protection. And they're still earthly. It's the 144,000. And they're standing on a sea of glass mingled with fire. And so it's almost like this fire and ice picture, if you will. And fire, of course, is a picture of what? Judgment. Judgment. What happens, by the way, uh, when fire and H2O meet? What? Evaporation, right? And steam and this sort of thing. Well, this just seems like somehow God has made fire and water coexist. You know, God's mad. And it's not an understatement. You get it? You get it? In other words, you have water and you have mixed with fire. And I have no idea whether there's steam rising off of it, whether it's a violent. You know, uh, I, I've made fires before, and my wife is. My wife has made fires before, I should say. Uh, that are so intense that when you spray a hose on them, the uh, they the water evaporates so fast that it turns into oxygen, and it's almost like you're fueling the fire when you're spraying the water hose. And you ever seen a fire like that? It's so hot when you spray water, and it's just like Shh. that's when you know to call the fire department. <laughs> By the way, when when the water evaporates, you're kind of like, okay, this is game over. It's time time to quit playing here. Uh, but when that happens, and I've been, I've been kind of scared before. I've been just sitting there hosing the water until actually the the fire cooled down enough that the water began to have its effect. But at first, it was like the fire just got bigger when you sprayed water into it. Well, this is this is really a great picture of God's wrath and judgment because you have fire and water coexisting, and you have the saints standing on it. Now, what has been the prayer of the saints that we've seen over and again in Revelation? Vengeance. How long, O oh Lord? How long till you judge the earth? And now the saints are standing on this picture of judgment. And it's very, very intense, to say the very least. While the angels in heaven are given the vials that contain the wrath of God. And here I wanted to remind us about something that I haven't mentioned in a couple of weeks, and it's important to remember. Heaven's open at this point. And there aren't people going to and from except for the messengers, the angels of God. But heaven is visible. In other words, John has said, I saw heaven open. I saw the Son of Man sitting on the throne. And I want to remind you that those individuals who are not part of the 144,000, which had the mark of God on their forehead, but rather instead who are followers of the beast and uh, who have the, mark, the number 603 score and 6666, on their, on their arms and on their foreheads and who have taken the mark of the beast, these individuals are worshiping a beast with God's presence visible as the one true holy God. Friends, sometimes you and I have a hard time understanding rebels, don't we? Sometimes we think if they only could see, don't we? My friend, I want to tell you something. Rebellion is blind to everything, including the visible God whose wrath is coming, being poured out from heaven. And here are individuals that literally see God, they see His judgment coming, they recognize His character and His holy nature and His power, and they're shaking their fist at Him and saying, we reject you for God. You can't be my God. My friend, He's still God. And He's ready to judge. And so we'll pick up here next week. Father, thank You for what You've helped us to learn this evening, and I pray that you would help it to sink into our hearts and to our minds in such a way that, Lord, we would be afraid of your judgment. We would be afraid for those who are the wicked ones who have rejected Jesus for their Savior. God, I pray that you would help us with compassion to preach the gospel to the lost in such a way that, uh, Lord, they would, that we would have an understanding of their faith or their future if they don't receive Jesus. And, Lord, we, we desire for you to be finished with the work that you're doing today. But at the same time, Lord, as you tarry, we want to preach the gospel, but we want to pray, even so, Lord, come quickly. We want Jesus to come. And Lord, if Jesus would come this evening, that would be good. And so we ask for that as well. Thank you so much for what you're going to do now. We pray it all in Jesus' name. Amen. Thanks for your attention. We do have some uh, birthday cake and Rice Krispies. And everyone is invited. And so if uh, you don't have to rush out right away, we're going to celebrate Mrs. Price's birthday. Let's start by just singing happy birthday to her. By the way, let me just make a disclaimer about the whole birthday thing. If you feel a little bit uh, shaded or jaded or whatever because we didn't celebrate your birthday, my apologies to you. This is Mrs. Price. And so, uh, you know, she's just a little bit special. We want her to feel like it on her birthday. Don't you think so?
All right, let's sing happy birthday. <laughs>